So thank you for being back here. Uh, we will start uh, with an uh, opening keynote from uh, Alex Tabscott, which is the CEO of Northwest Prestige Venture, as well as the co-author of the upcoming book, Blockchain Revolution, which happens to be the same title of this conference, as well as a research fellow at Martin Prosperity Institute of Toronto. So um, we had the honor to have Don Tapscott at the last conference, and uh, now we will see what uh, Alex Tapscott has to say with regard to blockchain governance. Thank you very much, Primavera. Um, I would appreciate if everybody just avoided any comparison to my father because I can't possibly live up to that. <laughs> um, so thank you to, to uh, Primavera and Constance for hosting this event and for inviting me, inviting me to speak. Um, following yesterday's discussions and the conversations I had subsequent to that, um, I became you know, even more encouraged and even more heartened by the amount of innovation, the amount of passion that people are bringing to the subject. And I think I'm uh, convinced now, perhaps more than ever, uh, that blockchain technology is not only going to be the basis for the next generation of internet, uh, but also the basis for the next generation of the digital economy. So before we launch into the discussion on the next generation of the internet, let's talk about the first generation of the internet. And uh, what I'd like to do is maybe provide a little bit of a reality check. Um, it's been 20 years or so since the launch of the World Wide Web, and uh, there's been a number of incredibly important innovations. Um, society and the, and the economy have changed uh, enormously over that time. Uh, but still, I think it's, it's worthwhile to, to take a look at where we've come and, and what's left to do. So, of course, the first generation of the internet brought us email websites, the dot-com period, uh, a platform for the presentation of content, and then the so-called Web 2.0, the rise of the social web, mobility, big data, and the cloud. Today, I like to think of the internet as a computer, uh, where we use it, we program it um, every single day to, to you know, effectively do what we want it to do. Now, I think it's hard to dispute that um, the internet has revolutionized society, and for most people, it has changed the world for the better. But still, there have been some big costs, and I think importantly, some uh, big promises that were left largely unfulfilled. So a quick reality check. Distributed and empowering. The first um, generation of the internet was supposed to enable peer-to-peer -peer, uh, economy, the opportunities for people to share in global information exchange. Certainly that's happened, but one of the other outcomes is that a new form of corporate species had come into existence, and that uh, we dub digital conglomerates. So Google would be a perfect example of this. What is Google? Well, Google is an advertising company, but it's also in 20 different adjacent industries. And they can do that, they can enter into these adjacent industries. In fact, it's actually their goal to move into adjacent industries uh, because they're empowered with a new uh, type of asset, and that's data. And uh, data is something that we've heard before as potentially a new asset class, uh, like capital itself. And what they've been able to do with the data is mine it, frack it, if you will, as big data frackers to glean new detail. So if anyone's familiar with the concept of fracking, there's huge reserves of energy, oil and gas, they're stored in rock all over the world. For years, they've been basically inaccessible. The introdu introduction of new technology has created new ways to access that, or rather access that oil. The same is true for the insight and information that can be gleaned from huge pools of data. But it's not just corporations that are using our data. It's large government organizations. And this isn't just true in authoritarian regimes like Iran or like in China or in Russia, but true in democratic countries as well, where data is being used against you. What about the second promise of the internet? Prosperity for all. This is supposed to be a period of vast prosperity where benefits were shared across the globe and by people in every single different class. Well, the best-selling book of last year, Capital in the 21st Century, was written by a Marxist, Thomas Piketty. And while you might be able to argue with some of the me methodologies of uh, the work that he did, the fundamental thesis um, is pretty defensible. And that's effectively that in the period, in the last 30 years specifically, income inequality um, has not only grown, it's accelerated. So the benefits of the new economy are being enjoyed by some, by not by all. And as a result, you're seeing this asymmetric concentration of wealth. So it's not a flatter society, it's actually one that's defined by larger polarization between the haves and the have-nots. Now you can debate whether or not 
that's a result of the technology itself or whether or not it's a result of the return on capital versus the return on labor productivity, which is essential to his argument. Uh, but still, I think the internet and technology do have a role to play. Now, we've seen that as well with the growth in these digital conglomerates and the wealthy entrepreneurs and the people who have been close to those companies who have seen that concentration of wealth. What about full employment? Um, I'm reminded every time that I come to Europe that youth unemployment is still a massive issue. And in fact, in, in my home country of Canada, unemployment or underemployment, which is college grads who have to accept work in roles that are not befitting their education or have to delay making important steps forward in life, is a really big problem. So the internet was supposed to spur economic development, entrepreneurship being core among them. Lower costs of entry for new companies would mean a source of new jobs for um, the working class and, and for people generally. Uh, after all, companies five years or less in age are the ones that, generally speaking, hire the most employees. And obviously, there were huge economic benefits um, generally felt in the developing world. But the middle class in the developed world, in the United States, Canada, Europe, Japan, and the like, um, haven't experienced the same kinds of benefits. So someone commented to me uh, yesterday that Uber can basically operate now with a team of 600 highly trained, highly technical, well-educated employees and effectively own the entire taxi market globally. Now, of course, keep in mind there are millions of drivers and they might enter into you know, freight shipping or food delivery and the like. But what happens when um, self-driving automated cars come into existence? Um, what ends up happening is you get this huge concentration of wealth uh, not felt by most people. If you look at some of the big digital conglomerates that have come into existence over the past 10 years, um, it's sort of case in point, right? So Facebook's got a market cap of $230 billion. It generates billions of dollars in profit. It's fundamentally reoriented our, our concept of society, how we interact. It employs 9,000 people. General Electric, an old economy company, uh, employs 320,000 people. Of course, that might change with the advent of the Internet of Things and uh, further automation. And then the final point, freedom for all. So the old media was controlled, it was top down, it was hierarchical. The new media, everyone participates. And true, there are examples of that where the flattening of, uh, of information participation, the flattening of the media, um, the balkanization of the media into various different groups has created opportunities for uh, people to express their views. The Arab Spring, the Occupy Wall Street movement are all good examples of that. But the reality is that today there's still huge swaths of the globe where the internet is censored, um, where political views are suppressed, and where people don't have that full access to information. Okay, so let's, let's just recap here. Distributed and empowering. Well, uh, certainly democratized information to a large extent, but also led to asymmetric benefits to a number of large institutions who captured a disproportionate amount of influence and, uh, and a disproportionate amount of data without any commensurate benefit to the people who are actually supplying the data. How about prosperity? Sure, the internet brought a bunch of prosperity around the globe and certainly created new wealth and the creation of new institutions and new companies, but again, it became concentrated in a few hands. Full employment, again, technology might actually be part of the problem. As for freedom, notwithstanding the success of the Arab Spring, much of the world still has limited access um, to the whole internet, and even in democratized countries, large state-based institutions are using information against us. So, should we conclude that the digital revolution was a failure? No, of course not. There are obviously huge benefits that um, were brought about as a result, new capabilities, but also I think more importantly is that we're only really in the first stage. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is about the second stage of the digital revolution and the next generation internet. So what does the next generation internet look like? It's all about the blockchain. So the first generation of the internet brought us the World Wide Web. The second generation is bringing us the World Wide Ledger. The ledger of everything. A worldwide ledger. What kind of new capabilities and possibilities could that entail and could that enable? A record of who owns what, who bought what, who traded what, who married whom, who was obliged to do what, who fulfilled their contractual obligations, who ordered an autonomous vehicle, who voted, who listened to what song, who watched what movie. 
it would solve two of the, excuse me, it would solve two of the big problems of the first generation, identity and trust. So determining, determining identity on the web is a, is a very difficult thing to do. And it hasn't really been solved, really, even in the first 20 or so years of, of the internet, uh, without the need for a third party, right? And that's where we saw a lot of you know, old capabilities of the old financial institution effectively migrating online, uh, not reinventing themselves, but just providing a new alternative, a new financial intermediary. Could this new platform for trustless transactions take trust and take identity and embed it into the system itself, embed it into the technology, um, where basically the principles of integrity, honesty, consideration, and um, having people abide by their commitments was embedded into the very essence of the technology. So what are the key features of this worldwide ledger? Uh, Bitcoin and digital currencies, of course, being first among them. So, you know, how to think about Bitcoin and digital currencies, I don't need to tell you guys, uh, but I have my own views. Um, first and foremost, it's an asset. I mean, I still speak to a lot of people in this room um, when talking about Bitcoin, not about blockchain, but about Bitcoin. Um, they talk about it going up or down, how it's trading, volume, liquidity, these kinds of things. I mean, those are the words that are used, generally speaking, to describe a, a speculative asset like a stock or a bond. And I think a lot of people still focus on, you know, what is the value of Bitcoin uh, the way they would say uh, one of those financial assets. More broadly, of course, it's a currency, a bearer instrument uh, that acts as a store of value, a unit of account, and increasingly a medium of exchange. Um, but of course, more broadly than that, a payment network. Uh, and this is a really interesting story. So uh, as part of the research for a paper we wrote on Bitcoin and blockchain governance last year, we spoke to the head of one of the largest consulting agencies in the world. And he revealed to us, and I won't reveal his name because he probably wouldn't want me to, but uh, he revealed to us that if you look at credit card companies today, about 5% of the total transaction volume is cross-border payments. It represents about 10 to 15% of the revenue, but half the profit. So there are these companies that are acting as intermediaries. They're capturing an enormous amount of value at the expense of consumers. Of course, they do serve a function. They, they you know, help to uh, assure the identity of two separate parties to a transaction. They have the insurance risk protocols, et cetera. But ultimately, um, they're still consuming a huge amount of value that could be more easily or more effectively distributed uh, within you know, the hands of consumers. And of course, a powerful new computing platform and fertile ground for yet unforeseen innovations. And as, truly, and as such, a truly global resource, not unlike the internet itself. So the internet of things. And this is, you know, a pretty neat topic. I'm kind of excited about it. Um, when we think we all know what that's about. But what kind of possibilities could that enable? When I travel, my Wi-Fi my wi in my home can meter itself out to users in the area for a few cents. Traffic flow and road usage, self-driving cars can negotiate a real-time basis between each other, or cars that can diagnose, schedule, and pay for their own maintenance. Uh, my favorite example of this is one I actually heard yesterday from Primavera and Constance, which is vending machines that can monitor their stock, place bids directly with distributors, uh, not only on what sells, but what generates the highest profit margin. Um, so logically, this would lead to vending machines that are autonomous vehicles driving around selling heroin. Okay, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Is that going to be a business you're going to launch at some point? <laughs> um, spare bedrooms, empty apartments, vacant conference rooms could rent themselves out. Of course, that's just scratching the surface. Rethinking financial services. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, PayPal, Apple Pay, these kinds of services, internet banking and the like, basically took the capabilities of the uh, existing financial institution, moved them onto the internet, right? Um, so now, you know, my checking account, my savings account, um, I could, you know, send money to people over the web. Uh, pretty neat innovations. I'm not going to discount their value and their importance. Um, but as Peter Thiel would say, and he would definitely disagree with my using it in this situation because we're talking about PayPal, I actually don't really view that as a zero to one solution. I mean, that's basically taking what happened in the physical world and moving it into the virtual world. And I think as a result, there are still opportunities for innovation. So the next generation, disintermediation or re, re of financial services. 
So of course the blockchain can underpin basically any kind of asset class that it can, can be described in code. Stocks, bonds, um, deeds and titles, trademarks, derivatives, patents, copyrights and copyrighted content, business contracts, just to name a few. Uh, even stock exchanges, and this is one of the interesting use cases that I like to point out, uh, which is that you know NASDAQ and NYSE, Na NYSE invests in Coinbase, NASDAQ OMX is testing blockchain technology um, you know, within their private marketing offering, private market offering. And obviously they see the, 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 the clear and, and obvious utility of this technology. But I, of course when, uh, when disintermediation occurs or when there's a big shock from a, a shift in technology, it's not typically you know, the old incumbents, the leaders of the old paradigm then end up filling the void, it's, it's new companies. So there's a small Canadian company that I know well called Smart Wallet, basically developing an integrated platform powered by atomic swaps and Ethereum to create a universal asset exchange, right? Where cryptocurrencies, fiat currencies, uh, assets represented by colored coins or digital tokens can all be changed and ex exchanged um, seamlessly. And it could be this small, relatively unknown company or Kraken, for example, who introduced um, you know, blind pools to basically match large batch orders, which effectively is what large banks do and what a lot, a lot of exchanges like ICE and NYSE do to a certain extent. That kind of principle could quite easily be applied to any kind of digital asset that's represented in code. Um, so maybe it's NASDAQ or NYSE that gobble these things up and, and try and integrate them into their existing offering, or maybe it's someone entirely new that we've never even heard of. Rethinking the corporation. This is something that actually Aaron Wright brought up yesterday, um, which is uh, why do we have companies or, or why do companies um, do more than just one specific thing? So the industrial age corporation uh, was hierarchical and vertically integrated and that was largely because it was cheaper and more efficient to keep all the capability of the corporation inside rather than outside. And this is largely as a result of transaction costs. So when you think about Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company as a great example of that, not only did he have um, you know, the uh, production line, which he became famous for, mass production, but he also had a timber mill, he had a steel mill, he had mines that uh, produced the raw materials that went into the vehicles, and a number of other things. Now today, auto companies don't have that. At the time, it was easier, more um, inexpensive to keep those capabilities inside the corporation. So could the worldwide ledger lower costs of collaboration so much that we see an entirely new breed of corporate structure or, or more broadly organizational structure of capabilities? So contracting and coordinating costs. Uh, these are some of the costs that Coe's actually spoke about in a, in a paper he wrote 80 years ago called The Nature of the Firm. He actually won a Nobel Prize for that and, and subsequent work on the nature of the corporation. Contracting and coordinating co costs could drop at an unprecedented rate thanks to smart automatic contracts that streamline capabilities of the corporation. Now smart contracts can not only change the architecture of the firm, but completely revolutionize the relationship between consumers and companies themselves. So this is something, uh, we spoke to Patrick Deegan of Open Mustard Seed and we heard from him yesterday. We interviewed him on, on what they're doing and basically, uh, I hope to do it justice, but those large um, digital conglomerates I was discussing are taking your data and then using it to make money. How come you're not seeing any of the economic benefit? Well, for one, it's prohibitively expensive to enter into an independent licensing agreement with every single person who's a customer if you've got human beings writing those contracts, enforcing those contracts, updating those contracts, et cetera. Well, if you had smart contracts that could automate a licensing agreement between a consumer and a company, then the data that you generate, whether it's the data you generate on Gmail or the data you might generate for a brand like Nike, can actually be you, or rather you can now take control of it, take custody of it, decide whether or not to monetize it, how much of it you want to give away, and even whether or not to volunteer more data in exchange for actually receiving economic value. This, I think, is an important uh, breakthrough, and it's pretty revolutionary stuff. The global IPO, this is great too. Um, there's no limit really to how many tokens you could issue on the blockchain. Um, why not issue 100 million at 10 cents, 5 cents, 1 cent, make them available to anybody with a smartphone. You could basically launch a global IPO outside of the domain of the New York Stock Exchange um, or any specific jurisdiction. It would allow people of any economic class or any geographic area to participate. These are some of the potential opportunities um, when thinking about the corporation. And of course, rethinking government. 
So there are social applications of this technology uh, for sure, voting uh, being first among them. But I think more broadly, there's an opportunity to um, take our democratic institutions and apply a new responsive, open form of government governance. Now, this isn't direct democracy or, or mob rule that we're talking about. It's just a more responsive way of governing rather than the, um, you know, I speak, you listen, you vote, I go for four years, you know, tinker away, and then you come back and vote again, rinse and repeat. Like, this is not a, the right way to govern. There's a way to, to bring about uh, more positive change by, by gleaning insights from the governed rather than just it being a direct down hierarchical system. So on the subject of governance, governing the next generation of the internet. So blockchain is, blockchain is the next generation of the internet, the new backbone of the, of the digital economy, and an important global resource. How will it be governed? So just a friendly reminder here, um, if you're familiar with the parable of the elephant, uh, one of the leading private sector people in blockchain, CEO of a huge VC-backed company, he used this pretty helpful metaphor, and I like it a lot. So he says, in the parable of the elephant, one person is pulling the tail, one person is pulling the trunk, and one is grabbing the leg. Each of them, each of them is saying something different. You know, it's a fan, it's a rope, it's a tree bark, whatever. Um, it's the same with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, is Bitcoin a commodity? Is it a currency? Is it a programming language that you can do contracts on? Is it futures? Is it a security? Is it any of these things, or is it all of these things? So, of course, it's early stage. You don't want to necessarily create rules, regulations, frameworks around something before you've actually had an opportunity to see how it's developed. So is it too early to be thinking about governance, given the fact that this is still such an early stage technology? No. Industrial age governance. The Bretton Woods system. So in the aftermath of the Second World War, as no doubt many of you are familiar, um, leaders of nation states, the most powerful countries in the world, um, got together at Bretton Woods and basically devised a new operating system for global governance. And it was based on state-based institutions, right? The IMF, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the like. Um, it was actually, at the time, pretty revolutionary stuff to create these global um, institutions that weren't strictly one nation or another nation. But ultimately, they were based on many of the same principles, right? Okay, so they were hierarchical, um, they were status-based, they were secretive, and they were largely closed ecosystems away from, you know, the governed of the world. So governments, talking about governments is, I think, a, a helpful thing to do here. Now, uh, I want to just make it abundantly clear that the dis discussion I'm trying to have today isn't about what kind of society we want to envision. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that there is no role for government in organizing society at all, um, that you know, we should adhere to voluntarism or libertarianism and the like. And I'm sure there are others who um, think that the state should have a, a big and important role to play in society. Um, so I'm of the view, basically, that blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, shouldn't be a political argument. It should be figuring out a way to make a global resource with huge potential work and what's the best way to do that. So governments. What, what are they good for? Probably at least something. I think that kind of gives away my view on things. Uh, but option number one is government stay out, right? Um, so we, when we think about that, I think about two things. I think about politically uh, the libertarian strand of the community, and technically I think of the open source side of things, right? Which is that we don't need network institutions. Uh, everything happens from the ground up in a messy, organic way. And I actually think that's a great um, an important component of governance, but I don't think in and of itself it's an organizing principle. As one person said to me, there are too many Scotties in the room and not enough Spocks or Captain Kirks. Option number two, prescriptive rulemaking. So this is interesting. If, if you've ever seen this graphic before, there's a man holding a red flag, waving it in front of a vehicle. And in Victorian era England, um, they instituted these laws, they were called red flag laws where any self-powered locomotive, basically car, uh, had to be accompanied by a human being walking in front of them, waving a red flag to make sure that horses and pedestrians weren't startled by this strange new contraption that was rolling down the road. Now, when you think about cars, what makes them better than, say, walking on your own two feet is that they go faster than a human being um, and that um, you know, they offer this personal freedom. 
So these are, I think it's, a, it's an apt metaphor to describe what happens when governments try to enact rules before fully understanding things. Now, one of, one of the outcomes of the digital revolution has been that governments are rarely, if ever, in possession of all of the facts or all of the resources to create effective policy alone, operating in their own silo. And I think when they try to do that, you end up with some of the rules that we've seen so far in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, you know, notwithstanding the effects of the community on the bit license program that law exists today. And, um, you know, as, as a lot of people have told me, it really serves no basic purpose. And it just puts an onerous burden on a lot of companies who are trying to innovate and grow. So what's the third option? The iterative approach. So principles over prescriptions, networks over hierarchies, collaboration over coercion. Governments should take an iterative, experimental approach where they set basic rules of the road, but more importantly, act as one of many stakeholders in a global governance network for these kinds of important global resources. So what, is a, uh, what do network institutions look like? And what are we talking about when we talk about governance that isn't state-based or governance that isn't just strictly consensus-driven? So the Global Solutions Network Program um, is a, a multi-million dollar research program that we launched at the Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. And basically, the argument was, we've seen the rise of new types of network institutions. And these emerging networks of civil society organizations, private companies, governments and individuals coming together to solve global problems is one of the powerful new outcomes of the digital revolution. So these multi-stakeholder global solution networks are a powerful force for good, and there are 10 types. I'm not going to get into every single one, uh, but what's key to the whole uh, concept of the taxonomy is they're orga organized around four basic principles. So they've got diverse stakeholders, private sector, government, civil society organizations, users, consumers, etc. cetera. Um, they address a global problem. Uh, they exploit the digital revolution by using digital technology and they're self-organized forms of governance. They're not hierarchical, they're not top-down. So state-based institutions, like the IMF or the World Trade Organization or the UN, should not govern digital currencies, Bitcoin blockchain, just the same way they should not govern the internet. For one, we think GSNs can do it better. And also, practically speaking, uh, it's very difficult to impose a command and control structure over something that's inherently distributed, global, resistant to control. So another thing that, that people bring up when I talk in the community is the benevolent dictator argument. Like, why do we need uh, GSNs? Of course, we don't want state-based state institutions running the show, but why do we need GSNs? Like, why don't we just have uh, a select coterie of enlightened individuals, sort of like, you know, Plato's philosopher kings? That's worked to a certain extent for other global resources, right? Um, Wikipedia has Jimmy Wales, uh, Linux has Linus Torvalds. But I think, and, and honestly, Bitcoin had, you know, um, Satoshi Nakamoto at one point, right? So um, I think when you're talking about something like this that could potentially pervade the uh, basic economic institutions and corporations of the world, you can't rely on the key man risk that you get when you've got one person sort of pulling all the strings. Well, not to say that, I don't want to say that they have that much control, but one person who's sort of, a, you know, the benevolent dictator of the entire operation. So we went through these four characteristics. I'll also just add to this um, that these institutions are networked, not hierarchical. They're mer meritocratic, not status-based. They're consensus-driven, and, uh, and they're voluntarily self-organized, right? There's no coercion. Um, there is no orchestration. And I think critically, uh, how do they gain legitimacy, right? Like how do you, if you've got different stakeholders coming together to drive uh, governance, like how does that gain any legitimacy? I think ultimately legitimacy comes from efficacy, from how effective it is, and it's something that has to be proven over time. So I think the most important type of GSN is actually a governance network, which is oftentimes made up of a number of different other GSN types. So I think the best example of this is the Internet Governance Network. Um, so we spoke earlier about some of the ways the current Internet has failed, uh, but by and large, Internet governance works pretty well. So what is it? Well, today the Internet is governed by what at one time would have been an unthinkable collection of individuals, civil society organizations, private companies, 
governments uh, and corporations all working basically with the tacit, if not active, support of nation states. As Gavin Andreessen uh, said to me the other day, it's basically just this ragtag group of people that kind of come together to solve what is arguably one of the most important global problems or biggest global resources in the world. So, of course, they develop knowledge, they share knowledge, they advocate, they develop and sometimes help to implement important policy, they develop key technical standards, deliver URLs, argue for, in some cases, um, influence key decisions by governments. No government, country, corporation, state-based institution, or any other specific organization controls it, though they have tried. Um, and I think that speaks to the efficiency and the resilience and the efficacy of the Internet Governance Network, uh, that it's been able to stay resistant to state-based control. So someone argued to me yesterday that, you know, all these different functions of governance don't really count as governance. Governance is technical standards, right? Um, and, and the concept of knowledge or advocacy or policy doesn't count as governance. I mean, I think the Internet Governance Network is case in point number one why that's fundamentally untrue. This is a helpful little pointer. You can't see all the different nodes of the network, but those are, that's government, right? So government's not in the center. They're not at the top of a pyramid. They're part of a network and they're working together with other stakeholders. So some of the important challenges, how do you design such a governance network? Do you create a new network from scratch or do you build on top of existing infrastructure? This is a really relevant point. Um, Gavin Andreessen said to us in an interview recently uh, that, you know, maybe one of the ways in which you could help to create an institution wouldn't be to start from scratch, to start with the Bitcoin Foundation or uh, the Digital Currency Initiative, but to start with the IETF, right? The Internet Engineering Task Force and make internet, or rather make blockchain governance, a working group within that starts small, uh, birds of a feather is what they call it there, and, and see how it grows. What will be the mandate for this network and will it have the power to implement and enforce policy? Tricky subject, implement and enforce can be difficult unless you've got governments as one of the key stakeholders. And in whose interest will the network act and to whom is it accountable? This could just as easily be called blockchain governance network, by the way. So going back to the parable of the elephant, by no way is, is this an exhaustive list because, again, we're still early on enough that it's, too, uh, it's premature to say what exactly this will look like. We think at least four different types of GSNs will play an important role in the Bitcoin governance network of the future. And those are knowledge networks, watchdog networks, global standards networks, and policy networks. So knowledge networks. Knowledge networks develop new thinking, research and ideas. They're the origination points for the dissemination of new thinking to other stakeholders and the broader network. And they're critically important to the sustainability of other GSNs. Namely, they support the development of evidence-based policy. You need to have an informed you know, population of stakeholders in order to create and act and, and um, implement effective policy. They empower advocates with access to timely information promote the development of technical standards and help drive mass market adoption and awareness. So does it exist today? Is there a knowledge network for Bitcoin and blockchain? I think there are examples of, of it for sure. I think Reddit is a pretty good example of a knowledge network. Um, I think because of the active dialogue of, of uh, Redditors and active participants um, in the wake of say the bit license proposal, um, the government in New York, the New York Financial um, Department of Financial Services, actually made substantive real change to the laws. And while the laws, you know, this might be a, a bit of a Pyrrhic victory in the sense that the laws were enacted with the changes, but they were still enacted, so it's still a loss. The reality is, without that knowledge network and the effective dissemination of important um, discussion about the subject, that law might have looked a lot worse. Other uh, emerging examples of important knowledge networks. Uh, Coin Center is uh, contributing valuable knowledge, I think, awareness and insight into the ecosystem. The Berkman Center for Internet Society at Harvard University, um, the Digital Currency Initiative, and others. So what are the implications of this? Like, why do we need knowledge dissemination? We talked about some of the other issues, but practically speaking, a really good world, like use case, in my mind, is the subject of remittances. Right? So everyone, we, we heard yesterday like a wonderful panel talking about financial inclusion and some of the challenges that are inherent to that. 
And one of them was, um, or rather, one of the, the big takeaways from that discussion was that the average fees for remittances range anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. In a lot of developing countries, remittances are not only the largest capital inflow into the country, they're actually the largest contributor of GDP. In Haiti, for example, it's 30 percent of GDP is remittances. In the Philippines, I think it's close to 10 percent. And right now, there's huge inefficiencies and huge waste in the system. So why aren't every single, so why isn't the Haitian diaspora in Montreal or the Filipino diaspora in Toronto or the um, you know, East African diaspora in London, how come they're not all using their smartphones to send remittances? Why, are, why, are the, why do wire services and other uh, old world institutions still exist? Well, there's obviously technical challenges and a lot of companies um, you know, have yet to be developed and built um, to manage that kind of capability. But also, I think there's a knowledge gap as well. Like, who's going to teach the person on the other end of the, of the smartphone um, in Nairobi, Kenya, how to accept a remittance payment? Is this something that happens organically? I mean, 80% of the developing world now have access to a cell phone of some kind. Um, that wasn't something that you had outreach and knowledge and all these kinds of things to teach people. They just figured it out. Um, I think with something like Bitcoin and blockchain, that knowledge is required. And I think that's where there's a need for civil society organizations, NGOs, and governments to work together to help spread knowledge, disseminate understanding, so that the obvious benefits, like say saving billions of dollars for the world's poorest people, can be enacted quicker. What about watchdog networks? What could the watchdog networks do? Well, for one, I think they could be instrumental in exposing money laundering, fraud, and terrorist financing um, with the use of Bitcoin. And I think that one of the challenges for this community is despite all the incredible innovation that's happening, there's every day we're reminded of people using this technology to um, commit crimes or are you know, leveraging people's ignorance to uh, swindle them out of money. And I think there's a potential for watchdog networks to perform a, basically a self-regulatory role of um, keeping an eye on companies operating in the Bitcoin world ensuring there are no predatory activities, theft, or fraud. But I think more important role of watchdog networks isn't watching you know, companies, it's watching the watchers themselves. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about governments specifically. So ensuring that governments do not overreach in regulating Bitcoin and blockchain technology, but also ensuring that um, governments don't use the technology against citizenry, against the governed, and don't overreach by violating privacy or other substantive human rights. I like this little cartoon. So the guard, warrior guardians of the future. Uh, I think the guy on the left, my, your left, is supposed to be the state. <laughs> uh, he certainly looks like it. He looks kind of like Rambo. Um, the reality is in the future it's going to be individuals, members of the community that perform this critical watchdog role. It's not going to be some over-muscled, well-armed, you know, roided up, uh, state-based institution. Global standards networks. So this is, I think, kind of at the heart when we talk about um, governance. So technical specifications and standards. So what do, what do standard networks, you know, really do? Well, I think that they create frameworks for common operations, transparency, and interoperability across private and public sectors. Um, more broadly, when thinking about how they're organized, they have to engage the expertise of individuals, institutions, and civil society organizations, and I think above all the private sector, um, because the private sector is the, what's going to be delivering a lot of businesses, or, a lot, or rather a lot of services and products to um, the community, and as a result, they should certainly have a say. So what might a standards network look like for Bitcoin? Is it just the developer community uh, iterating in the open source world? How about the Bitcoin Foundation? How about the Digital Currency Initiation? Open Mustard Seed? maybe all of them working in concert. I think a great example of this is the debate over the block size. And I'm, I'm gonna, I've learned enough for the past 24 hours to not have an opinion on this issue because I'm worried that someone's gonna come up and punch me in the face or yell heresy and run out of the room. Um, but, uh, you know, just as an example, uh, Gavin Andreessen told us that he's gonna basically commit the year 2015 to um, increasing the block size, trying to get the community to support his proposal of an increased block size from one megabyte to 20 megabytes. So in the open source, source world, um, where really there are no network institutions to speak of, Gavin lobbies his case on Reddit and forum boards, um, in email chains and GitHub and the like. Um, if his campaign of persuasion is successful, 
and uh, he gets the developer community on board. Eventually, a new version will gain mass adoption and be implemented. Is there a better way to engage different stakeholders in the network? I have a feeling that this entire conversation over the block size has happened in a pretty isolated silo uh, amongst a pretty small group of people. Now, some would argue that, well, when we're talking about developing technical standards, we shouldn't have the igno ignorant outsiders uh, who know nothing of, of the you know, underlying source code uh, involved in that discussion. I disagree. And I think the internet is sort of case in point. Uh, at the Internet Engineering Task Force, anybody, users, citizens, governments, private companies, um, can propose changes and, if they're successful enough, um, see them implemented. And I think what we need is, is a, a forum that incorporates the views of many different stakeholders in the network, not just a, a small group of um, technical experts. And even yesterday, uh, Juan Llanos uh, made this interesting point about a global supranational system of, to create standards to register private assets on the blockchain without require multi-stakeholder governance and what might that look like. So it's not just things like the block size. There's going to be all sorts of technical common standards that are going to come into existence, especially as this becomes larger and more important in the global economy, and there are issues that need to be addressed. Policy networks. So policy networks create policy. Um, they may be created by government institutions, but not necessarily. Uh, and here's what they, and they support development, create policy, and create and encourage policy discussions. So that's pretty easy. But basically what they do is help address some of the challenges besetting governments by bringing knowledgeable participants into the policy formulation prompt, um, process. So we mentioned earlier that governments typically, typically you know, historically, have enacted and created policy uh, with the changes, the rapid changes in digital technology. Um, you know, it's increasingly difficult for them to keep up. So that's where policy networks, uh, you know, find a role in helping to create and enact policy. I think policy networks also offer an alternative where governments, non-governmental organizations, regular citizens can work together to draft new policy or recommend policy changes to government, and uh, we mentioned earlier about you know things like Reddit and the Bit license, not bad, but again, I think there's more that can be done. So, the future can either be fraught with peril or with promise. I believe that leaders in this community and leading stakeholders in this network must take the reins and begin leading today. No one can mandate the existence of this network, so all stakeholders will have to collaborate to grow and sustain it. Governments need to be brought into the discussion. They can play an enabling role in, for example, helping the development of policy networks and in other areas where, say, technological, technical and technological standards are um, in play. They should defer to people um, and institutions in the network, stakeholders in the network, that might have more to say about it, say the developer community, the private sector, individuals, and the like. I think NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and other forms of civil society um, organizations can provide intellectual leadership, spread knowledge, and keep a watchful eye on all the stakeholders in the networks. I think today there's an unmistakable uh, vacuum. I won't say of power, because I don't want to connote some kind of hierarchical power structure, but of leadership. And the community is going to need to address that collectively. Because this technology is developing so quickly, it's important that everyone always keep an eye towards the future, not to create things that today might seem out fashioned, at least in this community, next week, uh, maybe in two months. And, uh, and always look towards how these principles can apply over time. And I like to use the internet. I, you know, obviously you've noticed that I like to, to reference the internet governance network. And I think it's, it's an apt point, which is in 1992, the founding members of the Internet Society could not have predicted all the revolutionary ways in which Internet technology has fundamentally changed the global economy, civilization, and society. Yet today, the Internet Society, other institutions like it, the IETF, ICANN, and the like, are as important and relevant as they were in the formative years of the web. I think a Bitcoin governance network comprised of different stakeholders adhering closely to the principles of openness, transparency, and cooperation could do the same for Bitcoin. 
legitimizing it, nurturing it, and stewarding it into the future. Thank you very much.